to get us going, let me ask you guys a question. It's a really easy one. I want you to finish the statement for me right now in unison. When the going gets tough, going. yeah, we've all been taught that since we were like three years old. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. But the question I want you guys to ask yourself this morning is that from a Judeo-Christian worldview, I mean, from what you know of the Bible, whether it's a lot or a little, is that phrase a biblical phrase? It's, it's definitely North American. It's definitely Western, uh, part of the, you know, of, of the world and all of that. But is it a biblical phrase to say, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going? I, I, I just don't know that it is. I remember when I was in seminary 25 years ago, uh, I was wrestling actually with that phrase and a bunch of other phrases that our culture uses. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going sells to a North American audience, but I'm just not sure that one could make a biblical case that that's what God says to you and me. If you've ever read Galatians chapter 5, you know that they make a huge distinction between what the Bible calls the flesh and the spirit, which is simply our own human physical reserves versus the power of God that is work within us that we talked a little bit about last week. And the reality is, is that there's something awfully fleshly, very human, uh, very self-focused uh, about that phrase that we've all been taught uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I I'm not sure that it's biblical. And, and so what would be a biblical phrase? And, th and this is what we want to talk about this morning. It would be this phrase. Uh, when the going gets tough, the tough learn to hang in there. Uh, when the going gets tough, the tough learn to persevere. Uh, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough learn how to stay in the ring for the long haul. It's called the, uh, well, we're not quite yet to the main point there, Don, but I'm glad that you're with us on this. Uh, when the going gets tough, the, the tough, uh, it learned to persevere. That's what the Bible says uh, to you and me uh, when tough times hit. I, I can remember, as you get, some of you guys know, I went to Hillsdale College when I was, uh, well, again, a long time ago. And when I was there, I'd just become a Christian. I had not been raised in a Christian home. We went to church only on Christmas and Easter growing up. I had no relationship with Jesus Christ, really no interest in spiritual things. But about, oh, just a few months before I landed at Hillsdale, I became a Christian. And then during my freshman year, I recommitted my life to Christ in a pretty radical way. And Hillsdale College now is, is, a, is a pretty strong uh, Judeo-Christian type of, of influence on its students. But back then, there were very, very, very few students. It was still pretty much a party school that, uh, that, that were Christians. And so there was just a couple of us on my dorm floor that were Christians. It was me and my friend Dave and my friend Dwayne. And there was one professor that we knew that used to be a Baptist minister. Now he was teaching religion at Hillsdale College, but, but he definitely knew the Lord as well. He's now head of the humanities department there, a guy by the name of Dr. Tom Burke. And if you guys have been around academicians, you know that they can at times struggle with arrogance, at times struggle with self-importance. It is just sort of the environment of academia. And I'll never forget one day I was walking across campus and Dr. Burke was coming toward me and he said, Rasmussen, how you doing? So I'm doing well. I said, I'm flying high in the Lord and I'm walking with God and all this other stuff. And he said, well, you know, I lead a Bible study with a few other students and you and, and, and Dwayne and Dave should join it. And I said, well, you know, we'll see. We got our own Bible study and we're starting this group called Campus Crusade for Christ and some other things. And so we think we're doing okay. And he said, no, you don't understand. You, you need to join my Bible study because lots of Christians fall away. Lots of Christians don't make it in the long haul and you need everything you can get. And so you need to join my Bible study. And he walked away. And I remember thinking to myself, who does he think he is? I got the Bible. I got God. I got Jesus Christ. I got the power of the Holy Spirit. I got a couple of friends. I'm not going to fall away, and I don't need to join his Bible study. I did join his Bible study, but that was my attitude toward it, at least at the time. And, 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 and wouldn't you know, four years later, when me and Dave and Dwayne graduated, Within about one year, I was keeping up with my buddies, Dave and Dwayne, and Dwayne had entered into a lifestyle that was very difficult for him to keep his walk with the Lord going and growing. Uh, last I heard, he's not walking with God at all. My friend Dave uh, basically went back to a different form of Christianity, an offshoot of Christianity that was not orthodox, was not, not or was rather heretical, and, and is to this day, as far as I know, not walking with the Lord. 
Isn't it interesting? I don't think Dr. Burke was trying to be prophetic. He was just giving a truism about life, and that is that life is hard. Life is difficult. Not, not when the going gets, not if the going gets tough, when the going gets tough. It's going to be a difficult road, and there's lots of casualties when it comes to life. And so the reality is, is what are you and I going to do, not if, but when life gets hard, and are we going to learn to persevere? Or are we going to follow the world and their mindset that says when the going gets tough, the tough gets going? Don, now we're ready for our main point. Here's our main point this morning. And that is that what Hebrews chapter 3 is going to teach us is that the only way to keep one's faith in the long haul is to learn to persevere during tough times. I'm telling you, that statement right there is not an overstatement. That is a thoroughly biblical, absolutely true, non-hyperbolic statement. It is. We're not overstating anything in that. The only way for you to keep your faith in the long haul, and I'm not talking about next week, I'm talking about this year, next year, five, ten years from now, is to learn what the Bible talks about, this trait of perseverance. You know, to this point in our look at the book of Hebrews, I haven't given you a lot of background uh, to this letter that we are studying this uh, winter and spring here at Marketplace. And the reality is we don't know a ton about this letter. It's one of the few New Testament books that unlike Corinthians or Galatians or Romans, that, that we know an awful lot about. It's just that we, we don't know a ton about it. We know it's in the canon. We know it's in the canon for a good reason that it's in the Bible, and that it definitely had apostolic authorship, even though we don't know who the, who the author is. We know that early on the church fathers chose it to be in the, in the canon in the Bible and for right purposes. But we do know a couple of things about this, this letter that's really important for you and I this morning. First, we know it was written to Jewish Christians because it obviously has a clear Old Testament focus tying it to Jesus. Uh, we know that it was written to Christians who are struggling with persecution and tough times. And we know that for two reasons. One, you're going to see repeated throughout chapter 3 and this entire book constant references to difficulties and persecution and the need, as we're going to see today, to hang in there. And so we know that the audience here was struggling a lot with pressure from the outside and the culture that they were living in. And we know thirdly that they were feeling a strong temptation then to abandon their Christian faith and go back to their Jewish Old Testament way of living and relating to God. In other words, you don't want to miss this, men. The going was getting tough. Life tends to be that way. And this group of believers was entertaining the thought that maybe life was more kinder and gentler before they became Christians. Can you relate to that at all? I can. I, I really can. I had a buddy of mine when I was in college, again, in the early years once, he was at Grove City College, I was at Hillsdale, and he once emailed me and he said, you know, because we both became Christians right before we went to college, and he said, you know, my problem started when I became a Christian. <laughs> he, he said, I, I, it, was, it was easier, actually, when I was out drinking and carousing and doing all the things that we did in high school than it is now. And, and, and then he theologically expounded upon it. He said, you know, I got a target on my back in which I experience spiritual temptation now every day. And I'm having to, to deal with that flesh versus the spirit. I'm having to walk with God. And then he capped the letter in a beautiful way. And he said, though it's a lot harder now than it ever was, I wouldn't trade this for anything. He said, because I've come home to God. And, and, and I know I'm in the sweet spot spiritually. But his point was well taken that many times the Christian life, we tend to sell the Christian life as become a Christian, all your problems will go away. Become a Christian, your marriage will be better. Become a Christian, your finances will come in line. Become a Christian, your emotions will now work well. And, and, you know, many of those things do happen at times. But the reality is none of those things are promised in the New Testament. The only thing you're promised when you become a Christian is heaven and you are promised the ability to be sanctified to have a Christ life Christ's life now, this side of heaven, but it's still going to be a very, very difficult life. And you're still going to go through very difficult times. And there's times where you think, maybe it was easier before I became a Christian. And, and that's what the audience in the book of Hebrews was struggling with. Now, when we get to chapter 3 then, he's kind of going for the jugular. And, and he's going for the jugular in this area of perseverance. Again, I don't think the motto of the author of the book of Hebrews was when the going gets tough, the tough get going. 
His motto was, when the going gets tough, the tough learn to hang in there. So let me string together some passages. I'll put them up here on the screen and, and see if you can pick up on the theme that's going on in this chapter over and over and over again. Uh, Hebrews 3, verse 6. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. And then look at verses 7 through 10. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. And then look at verse 12. Take care, brethren, lest there should be any of you, unless there should be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. And then verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast at the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. And so there's lots going on there, and we're going to unpack some of this more in the weeks to come. I'll explain that in a second here. Uh, but, but did you see and sense the clear call in the midst of all of the stuff going on here to persevere, uh, to not give up when the going gets tough, but somehow learn to hang in there, to ride the wave, even if you're being beaten against the ropes in life, don't get out of the ring, at least stay in the ring. And again, we're not going to go into it this morning. We will in just three weeks from now go into a lot of detail when we get to chapter 6 on this issue. I, I don't think the threat here in chapter 3, even though it seems like it a little bit, is that if you don't hang in there, you're going to hell. That if you don't hang in there, it's a loss of salvation. I'm going to show you biblically from Hebrews 6 why I don't think that's what's going on here. There are five warning passages here in all of Hebrews, but I don't think any of them say that you lose your salvation if you don't persevere. I believe the Bible says that you're guaranteed salvation the moment that you come to faith in Jesus Christ. But what I'm going to show you a little bit today and even more so in three weeks, is that if you don't continue on in your walk, if you don't learn to persevere, then the joy and peace of knowing Christ now and all of its benefits will be lost as well rewards the next side of heaven in heaven and in eternity will also be compromised. And so though hell and heaven might not hang in the balance for you and I persevering, the reality is our joy, our peace, our purpose, our meaning, our relationship with Christ, this side of heaven does hang in the balance and even rewards whatever that means, and we'll get to that in a few weeks, uh, and the next side of heaven hangs in the balance. You know, it's interesting. It says there that uh, we can be partakers of Christ, being a part of his house. Uh, that's relational language being used there. You can be partakers of Christ, of all the benefits he had this side of heaven. You can be a part of his house, a part of his church, included in a relationship with him if somehow you and I can learn to persevere. You know, it's fascinating uh, in the uh, Old Testament, th there's a great picture of this and how God makes it clear that though heaven and hell were not in the balance, their joy and happiness, this side of heaven was in the balance. So you guys remember when the Israelites came out of Exodus? Give me, you guys were in Sunday school, right? With the parting of the Red Sea and the plagues and then the Israelites got in the desert. Anybody know how long they wandered in the desert? Sunday school quiz. 40 years. Good, Howard, you paid attention back then. Good. 40 years. Anybody know why they wandered in the desert for 40 years? One generation. Be why? One generation. One generation. But what did they do to, to warrant having to wander in the desert for 40 years? They, turned away, from they turned away from God by whining. I know it's hard to picture church people whining, but they were whining <laughs> and they were grumbling against God. And it was due to that whining, that grumbling, that ability to not persevere, to not hang in there, to want to go back to Egypt. It was that whining and grumbling in which God said, all right, that did it. You're going to wander in the desert for 40 years. And by the way, this was before the days of resorts and water and air conditioning and all the other stuff that makes deserts nice. So, so listen to how Numbers 14, though, God kind of declared this punishment on them. This is really instructive for you and I. Uh, and because and, and, it shows us that though there was a, a, a definite uh, punishment this side of heaven for not persevering or at least a repercussion, uh, it wasn't a loss of heaven itself. At Numbers 14, 19, and 20, and then verse 23, I don't have it on the screen, but I, I want to read it for you. 
Uh, pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. And so the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. And then in verse 23, but shall by no means they shall see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. Isn't that interesting? So, some of you missed that in the whole Exodus thing. God did forgive them. He did pardon them, but kind of like you did with your kids when you were training them, you know, and, you, and there was a, a punishment for what your kid did, and your kid said, but dad, don't you forgive me? You'd say, yes, I forgive you, but you're grounded for a week. Yes, I do forgive you, but you're not using the car for a month. Uh, yes, I do forgive you, but that computer's not going to be turned on for a few days. Uh, and we all know that repercussions for our actions are different than whether we actually forgive somebody or not, right? So God forgives us when we don't persevere. He forgives us when we don't hang in there with him. But that doesn't mean that there aren't repercussions. But what I'm trying to get you guys to see is that perseverance is critical because it's what keeps our faith going and growing in the long haul, especially when life gets really hard, when the going gets tough. And yet, let's turn the corner. For any of us who have been there, we know that it's a lot easier said than done, right? It's a lot easier to talk about perseverance than to actually do it. So one of the things I love about the Bible is how eminently practical it is. So in our time remaining, we've got about, about 25 minutes here before we go to Q&A time. I, I want to share with you four things that Hebrews chapter 3 here tells us on how you and I can persevere, how we can actually learn to hang in there when things get tough. And here's the first one, and I love this. And that is that you persevere by staying close in personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't hear anything else, hear this today because it's a recurrent theme in all of Hebrews. And that is that one of the purposes of the book of Hebrews is to call you and I into close personal contact. It's an intimate interpersonal thing with Jesus Christ. Something that many men tend to have a problem with, tend to struggle with. I, to show you this biblically, I want you to notice with me two key themes in Hebrews 3 that have everything to do with this idea of close personal relationship. And it's a little bit hard to see, but when you dig a little bit, uh, there's a lot of fruit in this. First, notice the word faithfulness, and, and it's cognate faithful, that, that's used here in Hebrews. In, in verse 2, for instance, it says, He, Jesus, was faithful to him who appointed him, meaning God the Father, as Moses was in all of his house. And then in verses 5 through 6, it says, Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those which were spoke, to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. So simply notice, men, three times in five verses, it uses the word faithful twice in referring to Jesus and once in reference to Moses. I, I teach my church all the time that if the Bible repeats itself, kind of like a scratch CD, you know, that kind of gets stuck on the same tune, you might want to tune into that. There's a reason for that. Repetition means something in the Bible. So that word faithful there, three times repeated, is the Greek word pistos, very simple Greek word that simply means to trust, to believe. What you don't want to miss is that it's a relational term, picturing two people or two parties that are connected now in harmony and having dependence one upon the other. You're trusting uh, another. It's a relational term, this term faithfulness. Now, hang on to that. Notice me a second theme here in Hebrews chapter 3. And this uses the word, this uh, also rounds the word belief. It, it contrasted here by its negative unbelief. So look at verse 12. He, he says, Take care, brethren, lest there should be any one of you, any one of you having an evil, unbelieving heart and falling away from the living God. And then in verse 19, he says, and so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Again, in the English, it's hard to see, but you got that word faithfulness three times. Remember that? Now the word unbelief two times. And though it's two different English words, you know what the word unbelief here is in the original language that Hebrews was written in? Apistos. So, so you guys know what 
amorality means, right? If somebody's amoral, it means they don't have any morality. Or in the animal kingdom, if an animal is asexual, it means that they don't reproduce sexually uh, like the rest of the animal kingdom. So you put an A in front of it, and it means the opposite of. So in the Greek, apistos means that you have no faith, no relationship, no belief. It, you're not staying close in relationship. That, that's what it's getting at there. And so now we have this relational term used five times in chapter 3 here. And my question to you is, do you see a pattern? A pattern simply communicating this to you and me. Faithfulness, this idea of personal relationship and dependence on God is crucial in persevering. While unfaithfulness, the idea of not staying connected to God in relationship, is one of the downfalls of those who can't seem to persevere. And so perseverance hinges upon staying close to God in relationship. I think that's what the author is communicating here. And I don't know how some of you think, you're thinking this, you're thinking, well, I mean, you know, what other way can Christians try to stay close to God? I'm glad you asked, because there's two other ways that Christians try to t stay close to God. And you know what it is? Rules and religion. Isn't that true? Think about the three ways you can stay close to God relationship, rules, or religion. And I would submit to you that Christians tend to use all three in trying to stay close to God. We either understand what Hebrews is talking about here and keep close relational ties to God. I'll talk about how to do that in a second here. Or we kind of knee jerk or fall back on a rules or lifestyle approach to our Christian faith, just doing all the right things, what Larry Crabb calls good enough Christianity. <laughs> or we then tend to just go to religion. Just kind of go through the motions spiritually. Make sure you click off Bible study. Make sure you click off church. Make sure that you do all the, the things. And, and we tend to think, well, I guess I'm persevering that way. And I would submit to you that neither, neither rules nor re, religion are going to help you persevere at all in the long haul. It's only through relationship with Christ. I remember one of the first times I realized this again, it was back in the early days, and I was actually by then in seminary in Chicago at Trinity Seminary, and my uh, brother-in-law, John, my wife's brother, was up visiting around on the golf course, and, and John was talking about his Presbyterian church. He was going to a good PCA church down in North Carolina, and, and he was telling me about some of the struggles they were having. One of the elders' kids was rebelling and dealing with some difficult times and all of that, and and, 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 I, and I said to him, in my season of life then, I just said as we were teeing off, I said, well, did the, the girl who's rebelling right now grow up in a family that taught rules or relationship when it came to Jesus Christ? Because I find Christians are really good at knee-jerking to one or the other. Well, was it a grace-oriented home or was it more of a, a legalistic home? And I'll never get John's answer. He kind of stopped on the tee box there and he looked at me and said, why does it matter? I mean, the kid was raised in a Christian home. She knows what's Trump and... She's not doing it, so why would that be important? I was like, oh, tee off. Let's get in the car. Let's talk about this one. I, I, I said, because it, it's very important uh, what kind of home we're raising our children in, and the rules are certainly needed in life, and I have them in my home. The reality is, is it rules, and I said to John, by the very nature of it, are void of intimacy, they're void of closeness, they're impersonal, Rules, by their very nature, are simply things that you do. And though they're important, like putting your lid on your coffee cup and cleaning up your coffee cup after Bible study, those are rules, things like that. Though they're important, none of those things ever draws close necessarily by themselves to another person. I, I pause there, man. Think about that. I, I mean, we all have rules in our life. And again, rules are good. And if somebody doesn't have rules, theologically, they're called an antinomian, and that's not a positive trait. That's a bad thing. But the reality is, is that if rules are the only thing you have in your life, how many of you have ever gotten close to another person through rules? Has it worked in your marriage? Has it worked with your kids? Does it work at work? You know, that your work, you, you, you list the rules on the fridge and go, don't you feel close now? Aren't, aren't, we, aren't we just real close as friends? Ne rules never, think about it, bring you close to another person. They're, they're important because they work in life. But as C.S. Lewis would say, they're never first things. They're always second or third or fourth or fifth things. No, no, no. The priority for God is to love him and to love him interpersonally and, and not to knee jerk back to rules, and not to knee jerk back even to religion. I, I don't have time necessarily to tell you this story, but I found an article a few years back I found fascinating. Again, for a pastor, this is an article that would always catch your attention. It was written by a guy named G. Vincent Runyon. And the title of the article is Why I Left the Ministry and Became an Atheist. 
I'm telling you, you're a pastor. You're going to read an article like that. I'm like, oh, why I left the ministry and became an atheist? I'm, in, I'm intrigued by that. It's a story of a Methodist minister who uh, had, had gone to a good school and raised in a good home and all this other stuff and became a, a, a pastor and then eventually left the ministry and became an atheist. And I thought, well, what's that about? So I, I read his whole story. And uh, again, one of the things I noticed early on in the story without trying to psychoanalyze it too much was that he really got into the pastorate because of religion, not relationship. He, he talks about growing up in a, in a moral home in which values were taught, and, and, and his mom even said to him early on that your father prospered because he's a good Christian man. I think there's some truth in that, but that, that's what he remembered. And, and then he, he had some, some convictions on a social justice level, and so he felt like being a pastor would be kind of a hand-in-glove fit with that. And then he said he never really rebelled as a kid, but was kind of interested in church things. And then, and then listen to what he says, because he was in the marketplace. And he says, you know, I, I didn't receive promotions fast enough to suit me, so I, I quit. Religion had made me an introspective type of individual, which I think will explain how at a youth religious conference I became disgusted with myself and resolved that I would be more selfless and not seek money, but become a minister. So I'm reading his story, and I'm going, he never once mentioned Jesus. He never once mentioned a relationship, never once mentioned faith, never once mentioned anything that you're going to find all throughout the book of Galatians, the book of Romans, even the book of Corinthians, and, and, and all throughout the New Testament, all about Jesus' ministry. He never mentions anything like that. It was all about religion. It was all about morality. Good things, mind you, but it doesn't surprise me then that this man didn't persevere. It doesn't surprise me if the sum of one's faith boils down to rules and religion that we have a problem persevering in the long haul. Neither of those things are, are, are going to carry it, uh, us. And think about it this way, and with this we'll move on. Uh, what's involved in a relationship? I told you a second ago I'd help you learn how to have a relationship with Christ. Well, what's involved? It's really not complicated. People ask me this all the time. You know, Jamie, you talk about a relationship with Christ. Well, how do I do that? In one sense, I want to tease men when they ask me, how do I have a relationship? Because think about what we're asking men. How do you have a relationship? Well, ask your wife that before bed tonight, then duck, and then listen to her answer. Here's how you have a relationship. You talk to someone and you listen back. You learn to focus on the other person and have an interest in their life and what they say and what they do, a genuine interest that comes from a heart of love, and then you listen. A relationship is two-sided, where you give and then you take. You care for them as much, and Jesus says even more, than yourself. So, so think about a good marriage. Think about a good relationship with your child. Think about one of your best male friends. What makes that relationship work? You have a genuine interest in them. When they, when they talk to you or in the hospital, you go visit them. You listen to them. You care for them. And, 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 and it's a relationship. And, and the point is, it's no different with God. God says, talk to me. That's called prayer. He says, listen to me. It's called reading about him in his word, learning to hear him in his still small voice, learning to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, he says, care more about me than everything else in your life. I'm telling you, that'll make a relationship work, men. You care about your wife more than any other human thing in this world, she's going to feel very cherished by you. That's the value you took when you got married, by the way, to love, honor, and cherish. She'll feel cherished by you. God says the same thing. Care about me above all other, th other things in life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're now in a relational stance with you and God. Again, Lewis says, first things and second things. Keep God in first place status, and, and now you're learning to relate to him. And, and so a relationship with God is not hard to understand. It's difficult to live. It, it takes daily having time set aside for you to talk to him in prayer, and at times that they're not, not hearing back immediately. I like how, I think it was Hybels that said it years ago. He said, God always gives one of three answers to prayer, right? Yes, no, or wait. And it's that wait one we don't like. But the reality is, is that there's your answer. Wait. And, and sometimes, Andrew Murray writes about this, the, the silence in waiting, learning to wait on God, an Old Testament trait is, is a hard thing. You can talk about persevering. But make no mistake, men, when you're in the ring, relating to God, reading about him in his word, talking to him in prayer, having a regular discipline, time with him, you're relating to him. 
And in the long haul, what God says is you will persevere. More so than religion, more so than rules, if you're relating to God and staying in the ring that way, you're going to persevere in the long haul. I, I love how the psalmist says it. There's weeping in the night, but there is joy, joy in the morning. Th that's a principle that's biblical. Hang in there long enough, learn to persevere. I've never met a man yet who didn't eventually say, ah, the sun is coming up over the horizon. Might not always be the way you want it, I mean, it might not be, mean that your business turns around. It might not mean that all, all your emotions work really right. But, but it does mean that God is in your life. You're in that sweet spot spiritually. He's ministering to your spirit. And you say, I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I know Jesus. I'm close to him. And, and because of that, I can handle anything that comes my way with him. Do, do you see how this relationship with Christ is so key to persevering? I think the first key, I think... The main thing Hebrews 3 is telling us is faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. Don't fall in unbelief. Stay in the ring with Jesus Christ. Now, not, not quickly, because we have just a few minutes left. Um, realize, secondly, what you have in Christ. This will help you uh, stay in the ring with him. Realize what you have in Christ. Uh, it's interesting. Before we even look back here at, at Hebrews, no, I'm, I'm going to do that for time wait wise. Uh, look at what Hebrews 3 says. Look at verse 1. He says, therefore, holy brothers, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. And a very important passage there. He's telling us that as we learn to persevere, consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Uh, so, again, it's a lot of Old Testament imagery in Hebrews, but does anybody know what the high priest in the Old Testament did? Again, this would be Sunday School 401. Troy. Once a year, when the Holy of Holies to give confession for the people. Yeah, it was once a year. It, yeah, it, once a year in the Holy of Holies, which was a, a part of the temple that you just didn't go into. It was forbidden for anybody to go into, except once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, and he would atone for the sins of Israel don't miss this, representing the people before God. Basically, the people knew they were sinners. They knew they were a mess. They knew they didn't, they'd known all the things they'd done all year long. And, and, the, and the high priest went in, represented them in their sin before God to atone or bring forgiveness upon their lives. What the book of Hebrews does, and this is so powerful, is that it now says Jesus is your high priest. You no longer have to go into the Holy of Holies every year. You no longer have to stand outside with the whole community hoping that nothing goes wrong with the high priest. This is a funny story. It's a true story. They used to tie a rope in Jewish culture to the high priest when he went into the Holy of Holies so that if he died, they could pull him out. I mean, they were like trying to cover every base. They were terrified that something would happen that would mess up this forgiveness thing going on. What's so cool about this is that Jesus, when he died on a cross, died as our high priest to bring us forgiveness before God, atonement, the forgiveness of our sins. So here's the cool thing. Jeremiah said it this way in Lamentations 3. His mercies are new every morning. So every day that you wake up as a follower of Jesus Christ and you start evaluating your life, and I hope you do do this, and you, and you start doing moral inventory of your life and say, how did I mess up yesterday or do this before you go to bed? I do. And you confess your sin before God. God says, well, I hear your confession. I'm glad you confess because confession is good for the soul. But I threw those sins in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, I threw those sins away from me. Not because of anything you did, not even because of your confession, but because of what Jesus Christ did for you and me. One of the greatest resources you have as a follower of Jesus, don't miss this, men, is a forgiven life. God's forgiven you for everything. He's forgiven you for everything you did yesterday, everything you've done so far today, Go think about that one on your way to work. Everything that you will do for the rest of today, for the rest of your life, is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. He has forgiven you. I like how Ephesians 1.3 says it. It says that we've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I've had every spiritual blessing. It sounds like we got a lot more than maybe we think we have on a spiritual level. And we do. In verse 6 there it says, But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. And then in Hebrews 3.14 it says that we have become partakers of Christ. I mean the reality is, is that there's language throughout this entire chapter that tells us that you and I right now have benefits right before us in knowing Christ, forgiveness, joy, peace, power, the ability to live in the Spirit, all that 
we can avail ourselves of to help us learn to persevere. I ran across a great illustration. I thought this was an awesome illustration years ago, talking about the Franciscans, which were in uh, an order of the Catholic Church, and, and how the Franciscans were the first ones to actually grow grapes in California. Some of you didn't know that. And uh, they grew the musket grapes to make muscatel wine. Uh, and, and one year they had a terrible drought. And, and you guys know what happens when you have a drought with grapes. The grapes begin to wither, right? And so you can't make grapes on them because they're already withering on the vine. And they thought that they were going to lose their entire grape crop. But what they decided to do, because the Franciscans were awfully efficient, if not frugal, is they took the grapes down to town and they sold them in their withered state as, and I quote, Peruvian delicacies. And it was out of this that the Sun Made Raisin Company was born. So leave it to the Franciscans to take a withered grape. I mean, I, they're very close to the Dutch in that respect. Take a, a withered grape and sell it to the people and birth a raisin. Yeah, I found that a fascinating, fascinating illustration. Uh, the Franciscans were good at, at not giving up, but persevering and through realizing the resources at hand. Do you see where I'm going with this? Realizing the resources they had at hand what they had, even though it didn't look very good, there was still something they could make of this. And I think God says the same to you and I. Sometimes we get so to the end of our rope, we think, what can God really do? What, what do I really have? I mean, gosh, the business stinks, the recession, even though it's over, I'm still from the effects of it. Uh, the, the wife and I, it's been 20 years and our marriage hasn't kick-started again. The kids aren't really doing well. I got depression. I don't really want to talk about it. But I, got, I got this depression and anxiety and worry that, you know, and I'm going to Bible study and that doesn't seem to help. Have, have you ever been in that place? And, and you just think, well, what, what am I going to do? And that's when God says, you can persevere because you've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You're like a withered grape on the vine, but you got a raisin. <laughs> you got a raisin right before you in Jesus Christ. Hang in there by relating to him, hang in there by realizing the resources that you have at hand. And again, though there's weeping in the night, joy will come in the morning. As you're doing those two things, um, here's what else you want to do. Be on guard against the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, Hebrews tells us this as well. It's fascinating. It says there in verse 13, but encourage one another uh, day after day, as long as it's still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Isn't that interesting? He threw that in there. So he's saying, you know, relate to God and keep faithful and, 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 and even make sure that as you're uh, you know, going through perseverance that you're keeping focused on Christ, but then also guard your life from not behaviorally, fall, or from behaviorally falling into sin. And, and when you think about men, that makes sense. Like if one of your kids was struggling right now or, or a good friend of yours was struggling in, in your life, you know, you'd say, hang in there, persevere, but, but also guard your heart. Make sure you don't fall into some stupid sin that you're going to pay consequences for, for for years on end. And isn't it interesting here that it tells us that sin is deceitful? I don't have time to go into this today, but I did a study years ago when I was studying Hebrews here on, the, on that word deceit. And it's fascinating because that word is used in other parts of the New Testament. And that's interesting. Don, you can click, give a bunch of clicks here. Yeah, they'll leave right there. Perfect. It uses the exact same word. To, to link it to wealth, worry, lust, intellectual philosophy, wickedness, and evil people. Isn't that fascinating? The, the Bible explodes that word, deceit, into all these other areas that, that you and I deal with every day. And it says, hey, be careful with those areas. Nothing wrong with wealth. Uh, nothing wrong with, with relationship. Uh, nothing wrong with focusing on your future. Uh, nothing wrong with even intellectual philosophy per se. But, but those things have a deceitful nature to them. If we're not careful, they, they can draw us in and draw us away from Christ. And I think you, you men all know that, like the frog in the kettle. If things heat up slowly, that's what deceitfulness is about. Uh, before you know it, uh, we're in trouble. So you're going to want to guard your heart, if ever. If ever, when you're dealing with difficult times, you want to guard your heart against the deceitfulness of sin. And then lastly, and you guys are doing this because you're here today, stay connected with other like-minded believers. Again, Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today. I, I've gone on record saying that I've been a Christian now 30 years as of last year. I've been a pastor for 20. 
And for the last 25 years, there has never been a week in which I've not been in a men's group. There's never been a week in which I've not surrounded myself with other men who uh, will love me and that I can love and get super honest with. They can support me in my life. And I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty tenacious, independent guy. But even I realize I need other men, and, and we all do. So uh, again, make sure that you stay connected with other like-minded believers. So you know, when Dave and I, with this thought, we'll take questions. When Dave and I started this Bible study, uh, one of the things that Dave touched me with a lot when we were talking about this study is he said, you know, Jamie, there, there's a lot of hurting men out there. You don't hear Dave say that very often. I mean, Dave's kind of a tough-minded business guy, but, but he knows that, that with the recession, with life and all that, there's a lot of hurting men. And he said, we, we need to have this study because we, we, we need to draw ourselves closer to Jesus Christ. And we need to draw ourselves closer to what the Bible says our lives can be in him. And, and Hebrews 3 touches exactly that. So when the going gets tough, don't buy into the world. Tough gets going, that might become a fleshly thing. The, the tough learn to hang in there, focusing on Jesus Christ. Uh, guarding your heart against sin, staying connected with other believers. Do that, and uh, you will hang in there in the long haul. All right, we've got a few minutes for questions and uh, comments you guys might have. We've got two mics, one on this side, one on this side. So raise your hand. Let's hear from you. Yeah. Yeah, Don will do that. Don, if you could just go back and give us those uh, things that we tied to that word deceitful. Uh, that would be great. There you go. Yes, sir. Pastor Jamie, uh, verse, uh, verse 12 talks about falling away from the living God. I believe that the word in Greek is the word from we get apostasy from. Yep. Would you talk a little bit about apostasy? Mm -hmm. And I will talk about this when we hit Hebrews 6. You know, one of the most difficult passages, I think, in all the New Testament is Hebrews 6, of which Hebrews 3 is kind of giving us a little foretaste to here. Apostasy, by its very nature, does mean falling away. I mean, that that's everybody agrees on that. Whether you come from a Catholic or a Protestant Arminian or a Protestant Calvinist point of view, we all agree apostasy means you actually have fallen away. You've backslidden. You, you've distanced yourself from truth and from faith. And, and so that's what apostasy, by its very nature, means. The question becomes, I don't know if you're asking this, is what does that say about your spiritual life? What does that say about your eternal destiny? What, what, and what are we to do about that? Here again, one of the cool things, again, I always like to see where Christians agree with each other. What we all agree is that the answer to apostasy, duh, is to repent and to draw back close to God, you know, to get your truth right and to get your faith right. And so, again, everybody agrees with that. The thing that everybody disagrees on is what are the repercussions if apostasy is left unchecked? And when we get to Hebrews, in other words, what if somebody dies in a state of apostasy or dies in a state of falling away? You know, and, and again, we're going to deal with that in Hebrews 6. My theology, because that's deeply rooted, more of a Reformed perspective that would see the assurance of salvation and once saved, always saved. And when you've come to Christ, you know, that he, as he says, nothing can snatch you out of my hand, which infers not even yourself. Uh, I, I tend to have to then read, as I argue with Hebrews 6, it through the rest of the lens of Scripture. And that informs how we then exegete or what hermeneutic we bring on Hebrews chapter 6. And so I tend to think that apostasy, though serious and having repercussions this side of heaven and even on a rewards level the next, uh, nevertheless for the Christian, that that falling away still keeps you in the ring with God. Again, as Paul would say, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful uh, to us. Again, and, and so uh, our, our, our inheritance is guaranteed, as Ephesians 1 says, bound up in heaven. I don't know if that's what you were after, but that's kind of some thoughts on apostasy. Yeah, that helps a little bit, but you have yeah. people like Charles Templeton who yeah. led people to Christ and preached and yet fell away and became, fell away and became an atheist. Yeah. And, and that is a great point. Let me give you a comment. You mentioned Charles Templeton. I almost mentioned him earlier because I just, I just was doing a paper on that and opened up with an idea of Charles Templeton because he's one of the most famous guys. He was right hand, hand of Billy Graham. Bet, went to Princeton Seminary and all this stuff. And, and Templeton, you know, completely fell away and renounced Christianity. And his dying breath said, because of the problem of evil, there's, which we looked at, remember last fall, he said, there's no way that God could exist or Christianity be true. So people said to me, what do you do about Charles Templeton? I mean, you know, he's clearly, uh, well, he's vocally a Christian, and then not. I mean, is he in heaven or hell? Here's my answer to that. 
I don't have any idea about Charles Templeton. I mean, that's for God to figure out. Do we all understand that? We're not around, going around trying to judge individuals on whether they're in heaven or not. Like Jay Kessler said it years ago when he was president of Taylor University, he said, I think we're going to be shocked when we get to heaven as to who's there and who's not there. Because Christians are really good at going around judging who's going to be there. Even from the pulpit, there's times I want to say Mick Jagger's going to burn in hell. But the reality is, is that that would be a judgment that's not mine to make. It's not my job to say whether Howard Stern and Mick Jagger go to hell. Now, here's what I can do, however. I can have good theology. And I can have good theology that I teach people about what God says about heaven, hell, faith, repentance, belief, and, and even tie it then to things like apostasy and falling away. So I can inform people with my theology. I can share it. But that's where I need to stop and say, now it's your job to apply this. It's your job on an interpersonal level for, for you to do that for your life. It's not for me to say, because I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know your history. I don't know the full story of Charles Templeton. God does. And God, who is good and benevolent and kind, but also just, uh, is going to work, is going to be fair and gracious with Charles Templeton. And, and so again, I know it sounds like I'm, I'm pulling a, a politician move and not answering the question directly, but I, I think that's good theology, guys. I think that, and that's a good way for us to practice. Have your theology in light, talk theologically to people, and even interpersonally ask people probing or curious questions, but, but stop shy of saying, well, you're doing this, you, you, you're going here, you're going there. I, I don't think that is our case to make. That's God's case to make. And so that's why I say the judgment seat of Christ will not be a small group event. Do we all understand that? All, all of us will appear before him. Yes. Uh, Jamie, just a quick comment for you. This Hebrews is, is great, but as, as uh, I look at this, I'm, I'm just called uh, to, to remember kings. And if we go back to the Old Testament and look at kings, we'll see this, this idea of this, this conflict and this faith under pressure. Yep. Um, and the there's a, a great book written by uh, Dr. Michael Moore called Faith Under Pressure, a study of biblical leaders in conflict, which is all about First and Second Kings and, and this, how do we stay, how do we stay true and, and we see what, what true leadership looks like yep. uh, in the Bible. And I just... Good. It's a good word. Yeah, the kings, what you're saying, Rusty, is that the kings can teach us a lot, if you've ever read First and Second Kings, about this idea of the importance of faithfulness and persevering, hanging in there, and even making wise decisions. I think it's Al back here. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor Jamie, on that, uh, the accountability group that you have with four or five men over the 25 years, and uh, I'm just curious, do you have any suggestions for us, for example, how to look for, the, do we look for light-minded men? Do we have a... I, uh, you know, do you go intentionally go through a Bible study, or is that more like getting together, share, to be strengthened, encourage one another? How does what does it look like when we meet? Yeah, I think it just depends on. I, I, there's no, there's really, well, definitely, I, I look for affinity. Men, men will not hang in there with each other if there's no affinity, and by affinity, that's the like-mindedness, and you, you gotta like each other. You know, I've seen too many men's groups try to say, let's, you know, men's ministries say, let's try to get men together, and who cares whether you like each other, band together as brothers, yada yada yada. I'm like, well, how's that working for you? You know, so that doesn't tend to work. So I think that affinity matching and just, you know, allowing men to choose what men they like to hang out with is, is important. That's my personal opinion. There's no, I don't have any Bible verse on that. I tend to find pragmatically that works. The second thing is, and again, I don't know what men do. Here's the end goal. The end goal is you guys could get honest with yourselves you need, and, and really honest. You got, you got to, and you all know what we mean by that. You need to pray for each other and support and encourage each other. That's the end goal. Some men do that best by reading a book together. Some men do that best by doing a Bible study together. My men's group doesn't because we would tend to hide behind the book and hide behind the Bible because we're really good at that. We're all intellectually driven kind of guys. So we have a rule. We don't have a book before us. We don't even have a Bible before us, though we do our Bibles with us. We meet for a meal, and then we simply say, and we learned this from Larry Crabb, where's your red dot? Now, you guys remember if you go to a mall and you see a map, and what's the red dot signify? You are here, right? So our only rule is you've got to be honest about where you are on a spiritual relational level. What, is it, are you doing great? Is it joy time? Great. Well, then let's thank God for that. But what are you, are you struggling with stuff? So our, our, our rule is what we call the red dot. And these are mature enough men where, you know, I'm not saying that they don't ever withhold things, but we just know that we're being honest about our red dot. 
and, and that's the nature of our group together. And there's times where we get off on talking about politics and, and Obama and, you know, the Barrett Jackson, all that, because we're friends and we love that stuff. But one of us will always catch the group and say, you know, we just spent the last 30 minutes talking about this and that's been fun, but how are we all doing? And, and, we all, and then we always pray. And, and if for some reason we even run out of time for prayer, our rule is, and this is a great rule adopt, we say that if we don't have, if for the odd reason we run out of time for prayer, then our commitment is that wherever we're driving to next, you must pray for the group. No radio, no, you, you just, you pray between now and your next appointment for the men so that we're covered and bathed in prayer. So that's the way we do it. But again, there's no right or wrong in this. Just get the end goal accomplished, I think is a good thing. Good, we got about five more minutes. Other questions you might have? Yeah, Troy. Going back to the apostasy uh, discussion, um, I, I guess one thing that we don't talk about a lot is the lack of perseverance yeah. may be a sign that you're not saved at all. You've never come to Christ in repentance and faith and actually is, is a good test, a good mirror to check yourself against. <laughs> yeah. I, again, this brings up so many issues, Troy. Thank you. Uh, but... <laughs> but you know, here's how I, again, I'll give you my down and dirty, just real quick take on that one, because I, I've been declarative about my views on this. I, you're asking the question of when somebody falls away, could it be that they were never Christians in the first place? And that brings up the issue is, is fruit bearing, is follow up to one's faith. You know, what kind of a test for assurance is that? So, you know, I think that's what you're asking. That's the, the theological issue. I've always seen it this way. First John 5 says that the foremost number one test of whether or not we are Christians is our faith and our belief. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So I believe that, that our faith and our love are the tests, our faith and love for God, a relation are, are the assurance of whether or not you have. So if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, that's your strongest evidence, duh, that you are a Christian and that once saved, always saved. However, I, I don't think you can read the New Testament and not walk away with the reality that fruit bearing evidences in your life act as a secondary form of assurance. And you have to be careful with that, because I don't think they're the primary. Some Christians make them the primary thing. Well, if you're bearing fruit, then you know you're saved. If you never fall away, you know you're saved. Well, that's overstating the case a bit, because, you know, fruit bearing is not the primary evidence that you're saved. Faith is, and, and a relationship with Christ is. However, the flip side of that is that fruit bearing, when you see evidence, does add a secondary measure, and a strong secondary measure, I might add, that, that you are saved. And in the absence of any fruit at all, like if I had no secondary assurance that I was saved, I'd be doing an evaluation of my life. How about you? I'd be asking myself, was that faith real? Did I really have a relationship with Christ? I mean, come on, it's been 30 years and I got nothing. I mean, you know, you have to ask yourself that. So you got to see the balance there. We've got to keep our theology solid. And, and so results in fruit bearing matter. At the same time, I get frustrated with Christians that make it the primary thing. They run around and do fruit checks on everybody, you know. And again, I, I'm just not sure that's the way. Again, that goes back to rules. Then all of a sudden our, our faith is all about rules. I'm not sure we want to function like that as men because we'll just run from each other. Yeah. Hang on. Just sorry. And some plants, like some of the cactus we have, that seem to do nothing for years and suddenly shoot up taller than the house in yes. uh, just a few days. It's a great point. And you don't know when, you know, what time you're in the area, maybe like Moses, 40 years in the wilderness, preparing. That is such a great God point. Thank you. Up. And that's a grace point that he's making. He's saying that in plant kingdom, there's some plants that shoot up really fast. And there's other ones that just, they, they take time. They go through seasons and they're lying dormant, but it doesn't mean they're dead. And, and again, to look at a Christian and say you're dead, you know, you're never saved, to me is rather heartless. And C.S. Lewis points out in his book, Mere Christianity, he says, we don't know the history of all men. What if some guy came from such an atrocious background that even just a little bit of evidence of fruit that, that doesn't even nearly measure up to your life is huge in the kingdom of God for that individual? You know, we don't know that. And again, that's why judgmentalism is such a dangerous thing, because that's for God and that person to know. What we can encourage them is if they see evidence of fruit, that's a good measure that you're on the right road, way to go, keep going. Right? That's a good way to function. Yes? Um, Jamie, you, you, know, you made a point about um, rules and the... Um, religion. Religion and then the 
relationship with Christ. And, and you know, grew up in a, in a pastor's home. It's funny that um, I kind of missed that whole piece um, mm. with, a, with that um, relationship. And it wasn't until, you know, my late 30s that I realized that it was the identity when I realized what my true identity was in Christ. Yeah. And that grace that I received from that did it, it uh, enable me to, you know, build on the, on that um, yeah. um, with Christ. And then what you know this this today we, with the perseverance, you know, then it, it enabled me to truly through through my faith, knowing who I was in that faith, yeah, to persevere through it. That's awesome. Um, and then actually, you know, have some fruit, meaning not outwardly, but how I do do you know my my daily walk with my with my peers and, and how they see me yeah. through that. I love that about your story, and you shared a little of that with me, just about how, you know, you can relate to that religion and rules type of thing. And again, those aren't bad things, but they don't necessarily lead to relationship. And that's why, again, Kim and I have joked that, our, you know, we grew up in our families and said, you know, we didn't hear that we were loved enough and not poured into emotionally and all that. And my kids sit on a therapist's couch now and say, my dad loved me too much, you know. And so I just, you know, <laughs> says you can't win with anything. And the pendulum always swings. But I'd rather give them really good relationship and, and, and have them work the other stuff out than the other way around. So I hope you guys are doing the same. Yes, over here. Then with this, we're going to wrap up. I uh, was reminded of Josh McDowell's dad. Yeah. who had been brutalized to him and was a drunkard and everything and, and basically had a deathbed almost conversion at the end and, and reached out and he said he reached more people and brought them to Christ than, than I have, I think, in my life. Yeah. And during that short period of time. So we never know and never give up because you're growing as, as uh, I remember the old adage about, um, about uh, bamboo grows for about seven years, it's building roots, and then it shoots up like yeah. 70 feet in the air in a single year. So you never know what's happening underneath. Never lose faith that sometime God's going to use you in the, oh, in the yeah. future. Never give I up. I love, and you, know, you guys, are, you're ending on a good note. I love to give people assurance of their faith, don't you? I mean, I, I, when I know somebody intimately and personally, and they're really hurting and down, I love to say, as somebody said to me in my down times, you know what, I saw you when you were a prayer warrior. I saw you when you came to Jesus Christ. I saw your faith then, and, and though now you're really hurting and you're really struggling, I believe in what God has done in your life, and I believe that better days are coming. And so you're hurting now, and it might be a long haul, but I love you, and I, and I know that there are better days for you, and, uh, and God's not done with you yet. I, I just love doing that. I, that to me is so, so much better than saying, you know, well, I hope you come back to faith and prove yourself a Christian, you know, and it's like going, man, I was like, well, thanks a lot, you know. And just, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a difficult road, and so I think that's what we need to be for each other as men and doing that. All right, let's pray, and then we're going to meet again next week. Yeah, Dave, please. Uh, talking about your small groups and talking about having a relationship, uh, somebody once said that uh, true maturity in a relationship is when your mirrors turn into windows. Yeah. Just think about that. That's a good word. In fact, Dave, would you close us in prayer? That'd be awesome. Father, we just thank you so much for this group, these men, and uh, Lord, we especially thank you for Jamie and uh, how you have blessed him and endowed him to bring your word to us. Father, each week we are so blessed and we're so fortunate to have this group and have him. And we just pray for him. And Lord, I pray for each and every man in this room. I pray for their families, their spouses, their children, their grandchildren. And just that uh, this week you would bless them in a special way that only you can bless them. And as we go forth into the world, in, into the business world, that you would Allow us and give us the wisdom to take the word that we have heard here today and apply it. Apply it to our life, Lord, and, uh, and let us share it with others. And we thank you so much for this opportunity. We just ask this, Father, in your name. Amen. Amen.